My name is Kelly Ma, and I'm the Assistant Director of Global Arts and Collaborations at Asia Society Museum in New York. Welcome to the third of our Museum Salon series at Home with Asian Arts. I'm delighted to share a conversation today with three esteemed colleagues, New York and Paris-based artist Li Mingwei, Taipei-based pianist Pei Yao Wang, and Seattle Art Museum curator of Japanese and Korean art, Xiao Jing Wu. Regardless where we are in the world, the effects of COVID-19 have been felt as we live in ways unimaginable a mere few months ago. Last week, Hong Kong reported a third wave of coronavirus cases and museums that had reopened once again shuttered. In the United States, the resurgence of coronavirus cases has put a halt on reopening plans for many states. The Met Opera has canceled the rest of the 2020 season and Broadway will remain closed until 2021. In continental Europe, borders reopened and visitors have returned to museums, while in Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, most activities remain the same as before the pandemic hit. Despite signs of reopening, several international art fairs have announced their cancellation for the rest of the year, including Freeze and TFAF. Most of our creative and social life has transitioned online in recent months. We've watched musical, theatrical, and dance performances and, turned, and tuned into art conferences, lectures, and talks through various social media platforms. These coveted outlets, while opening up windows for us, have not necessarily eased our need as humans to engage with each other beyond the screen, especially in the digital age where arts events still require in-person participation and interaction to be a complete experience. It's hard to predict what lies ahead, but hopefully from our conversation today, we can take a glimpse at a collective future where we can share a communal experience of the arts, albeit with some modifications. Before we begin, I do have a few announcements to make. First, I'd like to thank our members and patrons for their continuous support. You may have noticed that our museum salons and other museum programs have been free and we are very grateful that we've been able to carry on with our work through the temporary closure of our galleries. Please consider donating to Asia Society Museum at any capacity to bring more content to you. Thank you. If you missed our spring exhibition, The Art of Impermanence, Japanese works from the John C. Weber collection and Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller III collection, you can read about the exhibition and its works on our website, as well as go on a virtual tour led by Adriana Prozer, the curator of the exhibition. All four of the exhibition lectures given by Adriana, Sinead Vilbar, Simon Kainer, and Melissa McCormick are also available online. Please visit asiasociety.org slash museum for more details. The importance and vitality of this concept of permanence has not lost its relevance and in fact seems to have become even more pronounced in our current time of uncertainty. Asia Society Museum is moving forward with the inaugural Asia Society Triennial titled, We Do Not Dream Alone. We've been doing a series of Instagram dialogues and online only content with triennial artists in preparation for the exhibition opening in the fall please visit asiasociety.org slash triennial for updates and check out our Instagram. For more information about all of our work here in New York and around the globe, please visit asiasociety.org and subscribe to our newsletter. So today's conversation will run approximately 50 minutes followed by an opportunity for Q&A with the panelists through Facebook and YouTube. Please list your questions in the comment or live chat sections. After this broadcast, the conversation will be posted within a few days on the Asia Society website. So thank you, Mingwei, Peiyao, and Xiaojing for taking the time today to speak with us and share your pandemic experiences, mm -hmm. especially across all the time zones. It's currently midnight in Paris, where Mingwei is, six o'clock in the morning in Taiwan, where Peiyao is very bright and early and three o'clock in the afternoon in Seattle where Xiaojing is. Um, I'd like to dial back in time and take a look at where all of us were when COVID-19 began. 
In February, Xiaojing, you and your colleagues had been preparing for the reopening of the Seattle Asian Art Museum after two years of major restoration and renovation of the galleries, the first since 1933. Can you talk about what this project entailed? Sure, but first I want to add my thanks to Kelly for getting us together from three continents and four time zones. It's a really unique opportunity. Um, yes, indeed, our Asia Museum reopened in February after a two-year renovation. But just as we were um, energized by the tremendous momentum built up during the opening weeks, we had to close the museum again in March because of the pandemic. But the silver lining here is that we were able to finish the gallery installations and open the museum to the public, uh, however briefly, right before the lockdown. And here I have some slides I would like to share with you all so that uh, we can see what we've done for the reopening. This Art Deco building opened its door in 1933 as the Seattle Art Museum. It's situated in a Olmsted design park, just like the Central Park. So this location puts us restraint on any ambitious expansion for the museum building. So in 1991, the museum's main operation moved to Seattle downtown and the original building became the Seattle Asian Art Museum. Today, we're one museum with three distinct sites. During this renovation, a modest expansion was added to the southeast part of the building, including a gallery and a glass enclosed corridor. This new addition really added a contemporary look to the back facade, while the front Art Deco facade has been well preserved. Seattle, as a Pacific Northwest city, has a long history with Asia and also known for its forward thinking and outlook. As our architects were working hard to update the building while preserving the 1933 Art Deco features, we curators also delved into a similar question, how to reconceptualize our narrative of Asian art for a 21st century museum. In the planning phase, we held meetings with the advisory panel and the local communities. The consensus after many, many discussions was that we should embrace the complicity of Asia, its history, people, and geography, and highlight the connections of Asian cultures, but without overgeneralization. So we took a cross-cultural thematic approach in our collection gallery installation. Each gallery is organized around a theme, one that is central to Asian culture and tradition. In so doing, we torn down the boundaries of both geography and chronology. For example, in this gallery, Spiritual Journeys, we presented objects of different Asian religions, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, and Shinto, but they were not organized by religion but rather by common themes we can find in all these religions, such as guards and guardians and guides, heaven and hell. And also we staged some carefully planned juxtapositions to convey new ideas through meaningful comparisons and contrast. In this gallery, bring blessings, three sculptures in dramatically different looks and scale form an intriguing group. In the center is a Chinese Lohan who controls the dragon and the dragon brings the ring much needed for agriculture. And on the right is a Nepalese Indra, a god for thunderstorm. And on the left is a pair of Filipino Bulus, deity of rice. So they are all related to agriculture in pre-modern societies. For the first time, these three works are in the same room, creating a connection that hadn't been brought together before. And also Seattle has a rather large population of people of Filipino heritage. And we've been trying very hard to have more presentations of uh, Filipino art, but our collection is rather small in that area. 
So in this thematic framework, we were able to show the bulls not only as an example of Filipino art, but also its connection with other Asian cultures. Another point brought out during the advisory meeting was how to present the vernacular. We have a sizable holding in Japanese folk textile. So we took advantage of these strengths in the collection and mounted this gallery titled, Are We What We Wear? to look at the relationship of clothing and identity. The thematic framework also offers a new context to show textiles from the Philippines, Malaysia, and Tibet, as you see on the left side of this slide. Because this theme is about the everyday, relatable to everyone, we place this installation a gallery right off the central court with the intention of creating an appealing and also accessible entry point for the visitors. Presented in the collection galleries are primarily historical works with a few strategic intervention of contemporary art to help us connect to the present. But for our inaugural presentation in the special exhibition galleries, contemporary art from our collection were featured. It presents 12 artists born in seven different Asian countries. Their work all in its own way addresses shared concerns about who we are and where we belong. Hence, you have the title here, Belonging. The anchor piece is an armor shaped sculpture made of tens of thousands of dog tags. Recalling his two year mandatory military service in Korea, the artist De Ho Se created this work to examine his identity as a Korean man living in the US. Each tag here represents an individual soldier and the sculpture as a whole embodies the relationship of the individual to the larger society. We also included Shirin Nasha's work, Tuva, to add an Islamic woman's voice. Inspired by the novel, Woman Without Man, Tuva, which means tree of paradise, revolves around a feminine tree described in the Quran. So this is just another example of our effort in including Islamic art in our presentation of Asian art and also in expanding the notion of what is Asian art. A recent gift to our collection, King Suja's Mandara, Zone of Zero, calls for tolerance and embracing diversity. The jukeboxes here stand in Bumandaras, and each of them plays a soundtrack of a religious chant, Buddhist, Gregorian, and Islamic. Even though this work was made almost 20 years ago, it is still as relevant and timely as ever in a time when we sadly still see intolerance growing in many parts of the world. So here you have it. This by far, I think, is my quickest attempt to capture what we've done in the last couple of years. Thank you, Xiao Jing. This is very exciting. And I know that originally there were many art curatorial conferences that were supposed to be held in Seattle this year so that attendees can see the new galleries in person, but all of them um, have moved to Zoom. Um, this also aligns with what the art newspaper editor Ben Luke observed this week that many museum directors and curators see the pandemic as an opportunity for a renewed focus on collections as opposed to one time loans and blockbuster exhibitions to draw record numbers of visitors. Now I'd like to turn to Payal. Um, so Payal, you played your last concert in February at the National Concert Hall in Taipei. And soon after the CDC in Taiwan advised the temporary closure of all performing arts spaces, you were informed that you had been in contact with a confirmed case and you and your family completed home quarantine following the guidelines. I'm sure by now most of our audiences have read stories about how Taiwan has been proactive in tracing and tracking contacts to help contain the spread of the virus at the early stages of the pandemic. 
Can you tell us what were the precautionary measures taken for the concerts before the temporary closure and what the sentiments in Taiwan have been concerning public events such as lectures, performances, and film screenings? Hi, everyone. Um, let me backtrack a little bit before I play this final concert. I had just completed two nights of performance of Britain War Requiem in the southern city of Kaohsiung. And the production involves around over 120 people, um, including children's chorus, uh, 60 to 80 uh, adult chorus member, and of course, orchestra member. I was the vocal coach for the production. And what's interesting is that the day before the final performance, I had begun rehearsing for this chamber music concert in Taipei. So when I was notified by the CDC, um, the scale that the CDC had to reach became magnified because I had been in contact with these hundreds of people in a completely different production down in the South. So I just recall um, the CDC informing me of my contact with this confirmed case. And I had to track back for two weeks to basically inform the CDC how many people, where, when, um, that I had been in contact with. Um, so before we enter the performance, any performing venue, such as the one in Kaohsiung or the one in Taipei, our body temperature had been taken and the hand had to be sanitized. Upon entering, everyone had to wear masks. So imagine this is early February, 100, over 140 people on stage rehearsing for the Britain War Requiem from the director to the chorus member, including myself, all of us wore masks during rehearsal. Sometimes the rehearsals are up to eight hours a day. Imagine eight-year-old children, but we all understood the importance of masks. So for nearly two and a half weeks, we were in rehearsal. Our body temperatures were taken sometimes three times a day. As long as you are out of the building, re-entering, the body temperatures were taken again. And some venues actually gave us stickers just to inform the building that our body temperature had been taken, maybe perhaps pink in the morning, and then they will recheck it again, green in the afternoon, purple in the evening. So I actually have a large collection of these stickers as a memento for this period of time. And then in Taipei, it's very, very similar, body temperature taken, hand sanitizers everywhere. And when we were informed, that we had to be in home quarantine, the other issue came up because most of the musicians in the orchestra had been teaching in different educational um, institutions from elementary school to high school to colleges. So you can imagine the scope. Um, it's up to us individual musicians to contact the parents, the schools that we're now in home quarantine and they should do home quarantine if they wish to, which is a very, very interesting concept because some people were infected with only 10 seconds of contact. And some people, for example, myself, I was in rehearsal, press conference, and then the actual performance for over 25 hours. And I was tested during the quarantine period and I was tested for negative. So it's difficult to say, but one thing I do know that the masks, the compulsive hand um, washing helped. Um, and the situation in Taiwan is that we are able to perform to up to full capacity, which means everyone's body temperature will be measured. All the audi audiences has to wear masks, but we're able to open the entire theater for live performances, which is a huge step and truly grateful for the situation in Taiwan right now. Yeah. 
Thank you, Payal, for taking us through this, you know, the last few months of how things have progressed. Um, that, that definitely gives us a lot of hope. So Minglei, um, you've been splitting your time between Paris and New York for the last few years. Um, in early March, uh, when COVID-19 became more and more serious in Europe, you were installing your latest major survey, Li Mingwei, Li, Gifts and Rituals at Gropius Bau in Berlin, and you had to leave Europe in the midst of installation. Can you describe what the atmosphere was like in Berlin at the time and why you decided to come back to New York? Oh, Mingwei, I think you're muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hello. Um, I arrived in Berlin late February and my team uh, arrived from Taipei. So we all somehow were equipped with masks. And uh, walking on the street in Berlin from the Airbnb apartment to Gropius Bau, we were the only people wearing masks. And it's funny enough, there were people standing on the balcony, pointing at us, laughing at us and pretending they're coughing. And uh, we just, you know, shrug our shoulder and continue walking. Uh, once we get into the museum, in, uh, because part of my uh, project of 17 project in the show, one of the major project it has to be installed with sand. So automatically the installers and the artists are were wearing face masks already. So um, for us, uh, we feel, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, because Taiwan, as Peia was saying, um, we all know that Taiwan knew about this very early on. So my parents already sent me, uh, put a lot of masks in my luggage when I left for New York uh, in late January and say, just bring this with you. You never know when it will come. Um, so it did, uh, we, I brought it to uh, Berlin with me and um, my team also brought some from Taiwan. When we were installing, uh, there were visitors uh, from the cultural ministry wanted to come and see what we we're doing. Uh, and everyone walked in without a mask. And this is already early March. And there are things happening in Italy already. So, um, and they, they still want to shake hands. You know, it's all the same thing. And I just say, I'm sorry, I need to wear my mask uh, because I'm coming from Taiwan. Uh, we know it's quite a serious thing, so excuse me for this. And they're pretty good about that. And around uh, March, uh, early March, probably fifth or seventh, I think, um, I actually got a text saying that um, United has, it's going to be, they're going to be closing down the border anytime soon. So uh, if I wanted to go back on the next flight, please let them know. Um, but the thing is that my work is only about 40% installed. So after talking to my team and also the curators and director, Gropius Pao, they say, you go and we'll stay to finish the installation. So Kelly, could you um, help me to put on the first image, please? So I'm going to show you the site. So this is Gropius Pao. And this is around uh, March 2nd or 3rd, when we are all ready to install the big sand piece called Gernikan sand in the atrium. Next. So um, as you can see, all these uh, artists are wearing face masks, not because of COVID-19, but because of the dust and the sand is uh, sort of floating around the air. Next. Okay. And this is right before I left Berlin, uh, the morning when I uh, caught the first flight out of Berlin back to New York. And I was lucky enough to catch that flight because uh, within 12 hours, the American custom border, uh, border custom start stopping people from coming in and asking people to line up to uh, to take their temperature. But the, the, the odd thing is that when you have 40 
you know, 400, 500 people clustered at the, at the uh, custom line and without face masks, that's really going to put everybody in danger. Luckily, I got in before that um, hectic um, entry from Europe and then stay in New York for about three and a half months. And then so, and finally, I was able to come back to Europe uh, to open the show. The show opened May 5th. Okay, next, please. So when I came back, this is what they have finished. Uh, everything was able to be finished before Berlin shuts down by the end of March. And when Berlin opens again on May 11th, I, I, I always think that all my projects are like little sleeping beauties waiting to be waken up. And they did. By May 11th, when the show opened, there were about 120 people the first day, and it's all time-based. Everybody's wearing masks, and there is only one direction to go into the museum and to the galleries and then out the museum. So it's highly organized. And uh, I, I, when I was back there, it's still like that. The last day of the show, which was uh, just about two weeks ago, we had about 700 people for the show. So they're doing it and they're doing it very, very vigorously and also in a way that would, it's full of confidence, which um, I'm very op optimistic about uh, museums opening uh, in America. If, the regulation the rules can be followed. Thank you. Thank you, Mingwei, for sharing that um, process. Um, so I'd like to go back to Payal for a bit. Um, so Payal, I've seen your concerts in person many times, mostly in New York and mostly um, operatic pieces. Um, for today's talk, I actually included a link to the video of your recital in Hong Kong from January on our events page. So if you haven't seen it, um, feel free to click on it after the program. And, and it's I haven't just... seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I just <laughs> found it. It's your performance at Taekwon. Um, and you're with, a, uh, I think he was a tenor. Yeah, so, um, so, oh. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so that was your um, recital uh, in January. And so I just thought that people might get a better idea of what does it mean, um, what is chamber music, um, in, in case they are not familiar with it. So, um, but since the, since the pandemic hit, have you performed in any online concerts and what have they been like for you? And how does, it, um, how does this format differ from a traditional concert for you? Um, interestingly enough, even though the National Concert Hall was shut down, but smaller venues were allowed to continue with performances as long as the audience plus the online performer and the backstage performer does not exceed 100 people. So some production when, for example, chamber music or duets, um, we're able to have audience up to about around six to 80 people. But the way we're seated, it's called the cherry blossom seating, which means for every person who has purchased a ticket, every seat around that person is left unsold, empty. Um, and then from the performer's point of view, we could see these sparingly spaced audience member all wearing masks, and we appreciate um, that they make the effort to come and um, to enjoy live performances. For me, however, I actually never participated in any on online performances. Not because I wasn't invited, I was invited, but because of the home quarantine, um, it's a very practical reason. I live in a townhouse and the Wi-Fi box machine is located in elsewhere, not next to my piano. So tried, you know, three, four attempts, but the Wi-Fi was never stable enough for the live performance from home to take place. And that's the only reason. 
I would imagine、um, for any performer, when we're at the piano, we really forget about our surroundings. We're immersing our music. So yes, performing through an iPad、um, does feel a little odd, but you only wake up from that moment when there's no applause. Real life applause from the audience member, and I really believe that's the only difference.、Um, but for, from an audience point of view, I do feel that to feel the energy、um, from a live performance is irreplaceable. So I'm hoping when、um, wherever you are, when live performances are allowed, please go and support the artist again. That's very touching. I think、um, we can. I mean, I work in the museum, and and for us, it's the same. It's like we've been having so many virtual online programs or doing like virtual walkthroughs of exhibitions, and I think, you know. Either as the viewer or as the presenter, there's a lot of things lost when you can't see your audience, and or when you're asked the audience, you're being you're very just passively receive on the receiving end.、Um, so, for、um, so Mingwei, for your exhibition at Gro Gropius Bow, which you mentioned,、um, with opened with a delay and closed、um, two Sundays ago.、Um, And you said there were about 19 works included, and、um, I wonder. Well, I guess、um, you mentioned a little bit about your work, and we also saw the、um, installation process of Gernika earlier.、Um, but for people who may not be familiar with Mingwei's practice,、um, he was last on our stage in New York in 2009 with then museum director Melissa Chu and the 2012 documenta artistic director Carolyn Krista Bakargiev, and you can find the video recording of that talk on our website. Um, where he talked about two um, projects um, that are not featured in this talk. So bonus:、uh, <laughs> most of your projects focus on interactions among strangers and relationships we establish with other human beings through chance encounters.、Um, sadly, in the age of the pandemic, as romantic as a chance encounter sounds,、um, the experience has now soured as it poses potential threats to our own and other people's health and safety. I mean, I don't even necessarily want to meet people I actually know for the same reason. So I was able to participate in one of your works in person、um, that, that's featured in、uh, Gropius Bow,、uh, Sonic Blossom, which is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2015, and also virtually last month as Invitation for John. Can you talk about the adjustments made for your presentation、um, in Berlin? Yes, thank you, Kelly. And let's see the、uh, the next image, please. Yes. Yes. So, Sonic Blossom.、Uh, let me just、uh, explain very quickly.、Um, is a project right there? Yes, that's it. It's a project that、uh, we engage classical singers, and、uh, there's always one of them walking around the gallery and making encounter, random encounter, by asking anyone、uh, the question, "May I give you a gift of song?" And if the person says yes, then the singer brings this person back to his chair, turn around, and sing a beautiful Schubert lead for this person as a gift. Okay, very simple. Now with this complexity of、uh, COVID nineteen, they the singers has to wear mask when they walk around the gallery. However, when they turn when they found the recipient. Uh, when they come back and start singing, they take off their mask. But then they also need to have、uh, this plexiglass front in front of them. Okay, next. Okay. So at first, I I'm actually quite worried about how this might、uh, frame the singer in in a, in a in a in a way that I I don't think is favorable to the singing. However, when I asked the singer and the recipient what was the experience like, everyone said that they felt like they have been really, really taken care of and being protected because we had this thought of putting a divider between the singer and the receiver. Next, okay. 
I also have designed a custom, a, a costume with a, our dear designer friend, Akira. And uh, usually this costume would be worn by the singer when they are walking around in the gallery. However, now because of a sanitary issue, we can't wear, we can't put those on the um, different singers. Uh, so now we have it on the mannequin. And next to the mannequin, we did have a didactic, a small explanation of why this is here and why it's not on the singer. Next. So that is Sonic Blossom. The other project that we need to do small uh, alteration is this project called Mending Project. Again, let me quickly explain this project. So when you come to the gallery, you'll see someone sitting there, either me or a volunteer mentor with a needle and thread waiting for you to bring something for us to repair while you sit in front of us and, uh, and watch how uh, we repair it. And of course, talking and conversing with each other. Again, that posed a problem <laughs> because of the conversation and the contact between these two strangers. So if you look closely, there is a plexiglass in front of me and in front of uh, Annie, who is, was the mender that day. So that uh, allows us to see each other uh, and yet also protect each other from being contaminated. Okay, next. Another project, Fabric of Memory. This is a project that I ask local Berliners to let me borrow a textile object that has a personal meaning to them and then put it in the box along with, along with the, um, the textile uh, article. We also have the story of why is this important to you uh, as the owner of this textile article. And the explanation is underneath the lid when you open the box. So that posed a problem because you need to open, close. Uh, so what we did is that on the right, if, we, if you look at the step, on the right side, there is a, san, a hand sanitizer, right? A disinfectant, okay? And then next. And then we also try to open almost every single box and place it closer to the platform. So people don't really have to go through the touching and opening of the box and to see the content. Usually when it's not COVID-19, uh, we always have the box closed and also in this very beautiful tie because the ritual of opening and closing is a part of the, 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 the project uh, of, uh, of understanding the content uh, of the project. Okay. Next. So I just want to show you that uh, the viewers are all wearing masks, even the little girl standing there. And the only person that's wearing mask, not wearing mask is the singer. However, she also has uh, a plexiglass in front of her. And uh, a very unglamorous thing that the, the singer has to do after she sang is that she, she had to clean the plexiglass with Windex before the next singer comes on. Again, it's for a sanitary reason. Okay, next. I think that's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you, Mingwei. So I, um, so if you weren't, we didn't have time to talk about this um, piece of work um, that's also at the Gropius Bow, but um, which is the dining project and you have modified it to be a virtual um, project called Afternoon Tea with Ming Wei. And in my background, I actually um, followed the recipe you have shared um, that you would have shared with your um, participants, um, this recipe that's in memory of your mother-in-law. Um, so um, for those of you in the audience, if you would also like to make this cake, it's an apple cake um, at home, you can find the recipe um, on Mori Art Museum's Facebook page. That's part of their MAM Artist Cookbook Project. All right. <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've already tasted the piece right before the program it was very good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah. So um, 
Uh, so I'd like to turn back to Xiaojing. As we continue to work from home in New York and Seattle, and we've heard all these nice stories in Taiwan and in Berlin where people can go back to museums and, you know, mingle. Um, and whereas in the States, um, at, at least in the two cities we live in, um, the date to reopen museums is, is so a while away. Um, I understand you and your colleagues have also been working on many online initiatives. Um, can you share some of these with us? Yeah, uh, we closed the museum on March 13th, I think around the same time as other museums in um, New York. And shortly after that, we formed a task force called Stay Home with Sam to lead the efforts to create more online content because no one was prepared for that. So all of a sudden we have to move um, to the online platform. So our communication team redesigned the museum blog for a more engaging presentation. So now when you go to the museum, go to the website uh, on the top of the web page, you can find a menu to choose what you like to do to read, watch, create, create, learn, listen, or participate. And that was not there before um, the pandemic. And uh, through this blog, our audience can read posts of object of the week. And usually we write only one page about the object of the week, but now we expanded the content and add videos and audios and uh, links. So um, really made the content much richer. And also, um, the audience can watch videos of artist talks or create art of their own. Um, but as a universal museum, we present art from all over the world. So we had um, virtual talks with curators and artists um, on many different topics. And um, in the political world today, sadly, there's still growing divisions. But in the art world, at least from the conversations we've had, we see so much more connections. And that's uh, really um, comforting and also um, encouraging. So for example, uh, our Native American curator had a conversation with the indigenous um, American artist from the Haida nation. And um, he talked about his Haida manga we, in that kind of work, you see Northwest Coast indigenous art, Japanese manga, and pop art all coming together to retell an ancient Haida tale. And um, that's really interesting and, and also um, encouraging to see how in the contemporary world, even though we're separate and confined to our home, we still can um, talk about um, a kind of a universal topic to share ideas about art. And also um, the Gardner Center for Asian Art and Ideas here has organized a series of talks with artists who immigrated to the US from Asia and the Middle East. Each artist shared with us um, about their art, their heritage, and how they're coping with the present moment or the new works they're creating in response to these unusual times we're living in. And I feel the artists like Miwei always uh, ahead of us, are always out there to respond to the current moment. So that's also very exciting to see what kind of new works the artists are making. Great. Thank you, Xiaojing. I think that's very encouraging in the sense that, you know, in the museum world, we're definitely um, learning, learning from each other and trying to see, you know, where, where our very distinct fields um, can, cross, can um, actually intersect and cross pollinate and have like more impact that way to our audiences and communities. Um, I think that's that, that, that sounds like a very rewarding experience for both your staff and also for your um, viewers. So, um, so I'm, I would like to go back to Mingwei. Um, it's, 
it's also it's um you've already spent the last week wrapping up uh your exhibition at Gropius Bow and preparing for your next exhibition, which I think will open at the Centre Pompidou Met. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, are there um, additional takeaways from your working with these public institutions that have reopened? Has your thinking toward your practice changed during this time? I think um, at first I was so. I was actually kind of afraid to go back to Gropius Bow because I thought people would just be so scared to not only go to a museum, but go to a museum that has 17, 18 of these kind of work that needs to be <laughs> touched and feel and to be connected. Uh, on the other hand, I actually was very happily surprised people came to me and say, this is what they exactly need to do at this point. They miss so much about the intimate uh, contact with people, um, although with uh, uh, a protection there. So um, uh, one of the project I did uh, also, besides from the ones I mentioned, uh, one of the project in the show, it's called Letter Writing Project. So that is for people to go into the letter writing booth and write letters of gratitude or forgiveness, uh, and then send it to the person who receives these letters, right? So now nobody can go into the letter writing booth to write anything because the pencil and paper could be contaminated. So during the conf uh, confinement, what I ask people to do is to do a sister project called Letter to Oneself, meaning that you write a letter to yourself, addressed to yourself uh, by saying uh, what you're worrying about and then by concluding the letter by saying, what is your hope or what are your hope for in the near future? Send it to the museum after you finish writing. So that uh, became a sister project of the letter writing project. So I, I think it really has an effect on me, especially with the kind of work I do. And uh, I, I do think it's, it's, it's actually quite exciting. <laughs> Does sound really nice to be opening letters from um, either someone you know or you know someone you haven't thought about for a really long time, or even from yourself. Um, yeah. So I think the examples given by Payao um, from Taiwan and also like Mingwei's experience in Europe um, definitely set really great precedents for us in the U.S. and as we uh, prepare to reopen um, at the end of August or beginning of September, at least that's what currently, that's still currently planned um, for New York and I think for some other cities. Um, and I know, and we all know that some of, some museums um, in other states um, have already reopened, um, but with a lot of um, limitations. So Xiaojing, um, what are some of the things that the Seattle Art Museum has done to prepare for when we can all return to um, the office and welcome visitors? Um, and also, we've also seen, um, and I think you talked a little bit about this, but um, just wanted to see, uh, see if we can talk a little bit more as well. Um, you know, during this pandemic, there's been a lot of um, historic protests related to racial justice in the U.S. and around the world. And it's really nice to see everybody coming together for the same causes, um, even though we are, you know, respectfully apart. Are there more philosophical adjustments to address these issues um, around equality, especially given the, um, the diverse community Seattle is known for? Yeah, um, we had hoped to reopen the museum on August 1st, but we had to delay that because of the rising cases in Seattle and elsewhere in the US. Our installation team is um, making changes in the galleries to um, better implement social distancing. Uh, but uh, I think the bigger concern is about um, public programs. As Peo said, you can't really get energy uh, in a virtual program, um, the energy that you can only get in a live performance. So we know um, we, we probably won't be able to do any public programs inside the auditorium for the foreseeable future. So we were think, 
keen about what we can do um, outdoors in a space where people can spread out maybe a little bit more and feel safer. So we came up with ideas like having music performance at the plaza outside the museum entrance, uh, maybe chamber mu music, small group, but hey, I'm sorry, you can't really play piano there. Um, or having dance performance at our Olympic Sculpture Park. But all these ideas have to be hashed out. But yes, the bigger issue we're all dealing with is the social justice and equity. Even though, um, we all know injustice and inequity are not something new in this country, but the issues are really magnified and intensified by the pandemic. In many ways, this moment has also impelled the whole museum world to rethink about decolonization and equity. So at SAM, we have a staff leadership team on equity, and they've been, they've been leading the lead on the equity um, work for the last couple of years. So we've already started the work uh, long uh, ago. And among the curators, we're discussing an initiative to acquire more works by artists of color. Um, and also, we're also thinking of ways to provide platforms for artists and the communities to have more voices in our museum programs and exhibitions. Um, in our Asia Museum, for example, we have one community label in each of the 13 galleries. Those labels were written by artist, writer, actor, musician, and even a chef and other members of the community. So they are totally different from the curatorial didactics and each one of them has its own personal voice. So um, we really think to engage the community to add more voice also contributed to the equity work we're doing. That all sounds very wonderful. And I also wanted to highlight that um, Seattle Art Museum actually hosted this year's um, uh, American Association of Art Curators um, earlier this spring, and this, the subject this year was on the um, was on Indigenous art and how how to be um, how to be more inclusive in the ways that um, when we are thinking about exhibitions and museums. Um, and even though the organization is mostly mostly based in America, um, the participants are from all over the world. And it was a very dynamic conversation and um, everybody, uh, all, all the speakers talked about, you know, different aspects, whether it's about hiring um, more diverse um, group of people to, to represent the communities and museums, or, you know, like how do, how do we engage communities in a more effective way so that, you know, we're not like all hoity-toity that we're part of the museum community. This is where we give you a stamp that you are like authorized to be part of part of this, you know, uh, I don't know, gang. Um, so I think I think um, if if people are interested, you can definitely go on AAMC's website to find more resources on this. And also um, the American Alliance of Museums also has a lot of resources on this on their website as well. Um, okay, so actually this perfect timing because we're now at the time where we should open up for questions. Um, and I see that we have uh, already have one question from the audience, which I think applies to everybody. Um, so it says, since you've been, since we've all been staying in one place or for most of us, yes, <laughs> during this lockdown, um, have we thought about the implications of um, in, a, an international artist or curator's carbon footprint? Um, and going forward, do we feel more responsible towards uh, the environment and would this have implications for our work? Um, who, who would like to start first? Lady first. <laughs> so Peya, would you like to start? <laughs> Carbon footprint, um, you know, what's interesting is that I'm a pianist. So I, yes, all of my international works have been canceled. So I'm not able to leave the country and perform elsewhere. Um, but I think the silver lining is that now every country will 
support and celebrate local artists more. Um, for example, tonight I'll be performing for an audience of 35, very selected group of people. And I traveled by train to come here. Um, all the audience member are required to submit their name and telephone number in case if something uh, were to happen, we can contact each individual who has attended the concert ASAP. Um, for international performer to come into Taiwan to perform, they need to do 14 day quarantine. For pianists, I know that would be a problem. It would be difficult for them to practice in their quarantine hotel because I don't think there's a hotel, a quarantine hotel currently that offers a piano. Um, so I think what will change in the near future is that the local artist will become, will have more opportunity, but also will have to be creative with their programming. For example, smaller venue, smaller, shorter program. Um, yeah, I think it will be different, but it will be exciting. Great, and Xiaojing, um, I know curators, like um, we all fly a lot to like art fairs and, you know, conferences. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Pia. I think it really compels us to be flexible and also creative. Um, I do, in, do appreciate Zoom. I can't remember what we were doing before <laughs> the pandemic without the Zoom. We were able to have international um, talks with artists and other scholars through this uh, online platform, but there are also many other things we could not do without traveling. Um, we would not be able to borrow a piece of artwork, for instance, from another venue, uh, from international venue. So that would really limit what we can do. And for uh, art fairs, yes, so many art fairs got canceled. And um, also what I miss the most is really interaction with the artist. There's really nothing like working side by side with the artist. You know so much more about the work, about the person, um, and it's not something you can replace. So sadly, yes, we, we have to be creative with what we can do, but we still hope we can go back to um, the time when we could travel and interact with each other more. Great, thank you. And Ming Wei? I cannot agree more with both ladies. Um, <laughs> I think things will change. Um, and as an artist myself, I, I did travel quite a bit. And the main reason is because when I'm traveling, that's where ideas come to me. Uh, somehow I've been, for the past three and a half months, I've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings. And that only is, it only gives me certain information and it's, uh, it's very uninspiring. I'm sorry to say that. Um, so a lot of time when I'm just walking in a different city, uh, bicycling, that is when ideas come and talking to friends, talking to strangers, tasting different things. So I still think I need to travel. And uh, in terms of carbon footprint, I am very conscious of that. Um, so um, I haven't owned a car since 18, actually. I only had it for one year. <laughs> Um, and, um, and in Paris, the mayors, the city mayor has been very conscious of making uh, a bike city now. So um, recently I just got into a city bike and uh, bike everywhere and it's really quite wonderful. So yes, it really, really changed the way I, I do things. And yet I also miss the physical part of being with some people and being in a place. And if, uh, if I need to fly somewhere to do that, then I will have to do it. Thank you, uh, Mingwei, Xiaojing, and Peiao. I think 
Indeed, I think we all wish that we could travel and um, either see the places that we have never seen before or, you know, learn from people that whether we know or, or not. Um, and it really takes away the kind of intimacy and, you know, the, the amount of information you receive from um, interacting with each other that's not through a screen. Um, so we have another question. Um, this is for Payal. So um, although concert ha halls are open in Taiwan, and con but are concerts sold out at, a, at the moment? And are audiences still enthusiastic about coming out for live events? Yes, believe it or not, concerts are selling out. Um, one thing I do want to mention, which is rather interesting, I think um, earlier I mentioned about the cherry blossom seating, which means every other seat is left empty. When they gradually open to up to full capacity, what the marketing um, department are faced with is that some people are reluctant to purchase ticket, just individual seats. Because you go with family members, especially if you're a family with children, you would like to attend and make sure that you're seated with your children or your parents. So I have seen some creative ideas, which is they have asked certain organization, for example, Rotary Club or school um, director to basically it's a group purchase idea. For example, if you know, you will have 80 tickets sold to one organization. Then when you arrive at the venue, you simply give these 80 tickets out and then they, it becomes free seating. But if, if an event were to happen where we need to contact the audience member who has attended that particular concert, at least we know that for example, there are six organizations who has attended this particular concert and all we need to do is contact the, the window, the, the organizer of this particu particular um, institution. Um, or I have also seen other people who offer buy one, get one free, which means if you decided to purchase one ticket, then we offer you another seat for free. That way, in the event that we do decide to open up to full capacity, we can still sell out the house, even with three day notice, which is, you know, in a day like this, if we're able to perform on stage, as performer, we perform really the same way for three, for the audience of three, 300 or 3,000. But I understand the reality is that the venue, the presenter needs to do the calculation. They need to make sure that they won't lose uh, financially. So we respect any sort of creative way that they can manage in a time like this. Thank you, Payal. And it is very true because I think a lot of people often don't think about this, but because you only see the performers on stage, but you have, but as you also have to understand that there are a lot of people that you don't see or you see them, but you don't recognize them, whether they're stage hands or, you know, people who are in the lighting booth, in the sound booth, um, and also just, you know, people who are maybe recording the pro um, program. Um, and also, you know, any kind of ushers, people who are selling you or checking, checking your tickets and, um, and selling you programs and so on and so forth. So it is a lot of people involved. And um, it's just that we often only remember seeing the people on stage. Um, um, so, okay, moving on to the next question, which is from a museum colleague from Cleveland. And I think this is a question for Xiao Jing. Um, uh, this is from curator Sinead Kehoe, and she was wondering how, uh, for the community labels you mentioned, how are these writers selected? Um, our education team reached out to a group of community members and asking um, if they would be interested to um, have input on 
the uh, the labels in the galleries, and also um, we have to kind of team up with the writer and the object. So, for instance, we asked a Japanese American musician to respond to a Nihonga string, and he even composed a, a little piece of music in response. But we would not, for example, ask uh, a, a, a Vietnamese um, artist or a Vietnamese uh, chef to respond to a piece that um, they would not know anything about. Uh, but in the same time, um, there's also um, objects that outside of um, the person's uh, expertise or their knowledge. Um, so um, they can comment from a very different um, perspective, often a time from a personal kind of connection. So instead of talking about the art historical aspect of the object, the community uh, writers would talk about what it means to 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 her or to him. So um, yeah, so this basically is a collaboration between um, the curators and our education uh, colleagues, and also the uh, community outreach. Great, thank you. So if anyone's interested. Um, further about like museums innovative work in label writing, um, especially like working with different um, people who are not curators. Um, please, um, uh, for our Arts and Museum Summit that we do every two years, last year we actually had a really great keynote from um, James Bradburn um, in, uh, from Milan um, of the Pinacoteca de Brera. Um, he actually talked extensively about how their museum, being a, a museum established by Napoleon to imitate Louvre, um, how, how they rewrite um, their labels working with children and like, you know, other, uh, other participants in the community to make it more lively. So definitely watch that. That video is online. Um, and so uh, I think there is a last question, um, but it looks like we have already addressed some of it, but if anybody wants to add to it, feel free. Um, can the panelists say a little bit more about how virtual versus physical um, or in-person programs right now we have, we often hear from people who are not from the arts and they feel the digital platform is a good substitute. Um, I don't know, Payal, do you wanna address that? I think you already talked a little bit about it, but do you have anything else you would like to add? It's definitely not the same. Um, it's, I would say in response to this, just imagine uh, Mingwei's work, Sonic Blossom, when a performer sings to a live audience, there's intent, there's love, there's the energy, but it's not just one way, it's, it goes both ways. Performer, we perform because the audience provide us with energy and this um, unseenable aura that we need in order to generate more and more color, more ideas. So live performance is what we're trained for growing up um, to be a professional musician. So for us to perform and to play, to sing, to dance, to act on stage, we need the human interaction. So it's different. <laughs> Anyway, do you, would you like to add? Yes, uh, I agree. So um, let's not even talk about art. Uh, let's say last time I was trying to do uh, a Zoom dinner with friends and it just didn't work. <laughs> it just <laughs> didn't work. It, try it and you, you see it's not, it cannot be substituted. Uh, Zoom is one reality but physically dining with friends and family or stranger, it's a completely different experience. And Xiao Jing, do you have anything to add from a curator's point of view? I miss the galleries. Um, as 
we said we just opened the gallery with all the excitement and then we had to shut the door. So um, yeah, I always kind of imagine like what it will feel like to walk into the garden court with the beautiful light sculpture above me. Um, so I think for museum goers, it's also experienced in a 3D kind of space. And on Zoom, on screen, it's only 2D. And it's really not the same. I agree. That's basically like learning art history through slides. You never know how big <laughs> things actually are or how impactful they are until you're in person, such as mm -hmm. Guernica. Yes. yes. And if I, if I may add one more thing, mm -hmm. attending live performance or attending gallery, this journey starts from home getting ready, getting changed, putting on the makeup or not, to go out, experiencing the sun, the rain, the snow, and then entering another space. So really the journey starts before you even leave home. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I have to say. So it's extended experience, not just sitting in a velvet chair, watching what's happening on stage. Is the whole day, the whole afternoon, the whole evening. And then the experience of leaving the theater, remembering, trying to recall why you had to see. So it's living life. Thank you. Yes. That's very, very yeah. beautiful. Um, I think this is a good place to close. Um, so to conclude our conversation today, um, Mingwei, as Mingwei has shared earlier about adapting his letter writing project um, uh, 1998 to present um, into Letter for Oneself for its reprise at Gropius Bow, um, he has written a letter to himself during the lockdown. Um, so Mingwei, I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing this letter with us? Okay, yes, it would be great pleasure. So when I came back from Berlin uh, and start thinking about this work, I thought I should actually write a letter to myself and send it to Paris, our apartment in the Marais. And the next time when I arrive in Paris, things will be different, but I wanted to document and write down what I have to say to the future way. So this is the letter I wrote to myself. Dear Mingwei, today is Monday, April 6, 2020. Listen to Bach. Just finished preparing dinner, received a message about our dear Jean from Michael, letting us know that she is slipping away. Hi, John, Mingwei. The hospital called dad asking him to come into the hospital and he is at her bedside. Mom is on a drip with the feed going into her leg. She is breathing unaided, generally okay, it appears, but her eyes are shut, sleeping, and not sure if she has said anything to anyone. He said he would call me, not sure if his phone would be on, as he said, he was conversing his battery, conserving his battery, but maybe worth a try. Off to bed now, we'll have my phone with me. Love, Michael. I share with John that this is probably best as she is not in pain, in deep sleep and heading to the other side softly. When I read this again, it would be when all things have come to light. Sitting in our living room with John next to me would take a long walk. Along the same, in memory of Jean, my, my dear English mother-in-law. Thank you, Mingwei, for reading your letter to us. Um, your generosity and thoughtfulness always inspire us and give us more to look forward to and a, a lot of food for thought. Um, I'm afraid this is about all the time we have for um, this conversation. And if you 
enjoyed our talk about how artists and curators think about bringing people together. Please stay tuned for our next museum salon in August, where we will be talking to architects of public art spaces to see what they've been thinking about the same questions from the design perspective over the last few months. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening again. And I'd also like to thank um, our speakers again, um, Mingwei, Peiyao, and Xiaojing for joining me um, at various times around the world. And I would also like to thank my colleagues, Oscar De La Fe, Nevni Gurmila, Anne Kirkup, Maya Murphy, Lian Chong, Christine Xie, Amy Lee, and Salvador Pantoja, as well as our intern, Sydney Catriopoli, Tabriz Mosening, and Andrea True for helping me with this evening's conversation. We can't wait to see everyone um, in person when we reopen the museum. Please stay healthy and safe. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.